The years 1981 through 1985 were momentous years for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There was increased international visibility and significant organizational changes to meet the Church's great missionary effort and growth. This period brought into focus the Church's threefold mission of proclaiming the gospel to the world, perfecting the saints, and redeeming the dead. But above all else, these were years of temple building, a total of 26 temples being dedicated during the five-year period. The year 1981 was ushered in with the Tabernacle Choir's participation in the inauguration of President Ronald Reagan. It was a moving experience for all as the choir sang the battle hymn of the Republic. Early in the year, groundbreaking ceremonies were conducted by general authorities in Papaete Tahiti, Nukualofa Tonga, Apia Samoa, and Atlanta, Georgia. And then just preceding the 1981 April Conference, the announcement was made that nine new temples would be built in Chicago, Illinois, Dallas, Texas, Guatemala City, Guatemala, Lima, Peru, Frankfurt, Germany, Stockholm, Sweden, Seoul, South Korea, Manila, the Philippines, and Johannesburg, South Africa. Serving with President Spencer W. Kimball in the church's first presidency were President Nathan Eldon Tanner and President Marion G. Romney. President Ezra Taft Benson was president of the Council of Twelve Apostles, and members of the quorum were elders Marky e. Peterson, Legrand Richards, Howard W. Hunter, Gordon B. Hinckley, Thomas S. Monson, Boyd K. Packer, Marvin J. Ashton, Bruce R. McConkie, L. Tom Perry, David B. Haight, and James E. Faust. Serving in the first quorum of the 70 presidency were Franklin D. Richards, J. Thomas Fines, Neil A. Maxwell, Carlos E. Acey, M. Russell Ballard, Dean L. Larson, and Royden G. Derrick. During the April 1981 General Conference, Angel Abreya, the first general authority from Latin America, was called to the quorum of the 70. In the afternoon session, President Kimball spoke of the adversary's challenge and the need for every member of the church to be filled with the spirit of peace and serenity. Always remember that if this were not the Lord's work, the adversary would not pay any attention to us. With faith and good works, the truth will prevail. This is his work. There is none other like it. Let us therefore press forward, lengthening our stride and rejoicing in our blessings and opportunities. It was during the summer, Elder S. Dilworth Young, a longtime faithful member of the Quorum of Seventy, passed away after 35 years of service in the First Council of Seventy and in the Quorum of Seventy. They were years of change, and Elder Young provided a crucial link with the past as new changes came about. In July, Elder Gordon B. Hinckley was called as an additional counselor to assist in the work of the First Presidency, and Elder Neil A. Maxwell was called to the Council of the Twelve Apostles. Later in the year, Elder G. Homer Durham was called to fill Elder Maxwell's position in the First Quorum of the Seventy Presidency. The Church's international visibility and missionary effort was witnessed as the first stakes of Zion were organized in Milan, Italy, and Lisbon, Portugal. Also, new translations of the Book of Mormon in Russian, Icelandic, Polish, Quechua, and Kuna came off the press. The Book of Mormon's influence continues to be felt throughout the world, as prophesied by the Prophet Joseph. During the summer months, two entertainment groups from Brigham Young University toured Russia and China. Much good came from their visits as lasting friendships were made for themselves and the church. The publication of the new edition of the Triple Combination was finalized in September of 1981. This completes the entire revision of the standard works with new footnotes, cross-references, chapter and section headings, and a combined revised and expanded index. The revised scriptures provide a great opportunity for all members to understand the Lord's words and commandments and thus increase their spirituality. 
During October conference, President Kimball was unable to attend due to surgery. President Hinckley conducted the opening session and announced that this was the first conference to be transmitted by satellite. Saints throughout the world would now be able to view the conference session and more fully participate in the conference. A month later, on November 16, 1981, the church's 22nd temple, the Jordan River Temple, was dedicated by President Marion G. Romney. We humbly pray, Father, that thou wilt accept this holy edifice, pour out thy blessings upon it as a house to which thou wilt come and in which thy spirit will direct all that is done, that it may be acceptable unto thee. 1981, national recognition, temple groundbreaking ceremonies throughout the world, improved scriptural indexes and references, and international satellite communications. Women's issues were among the top news stories of 1982, and within the church, the role and importance of womanhood was heralded as the Relief Society observed its 140th anniversary through the Tribute to Women celebration. Example after example come from women in many places, from women of differing circumstances in life, women alone, women with children, women old, women young, women new to the church, women in sorrow, women in despair, women happy. They form a mosaic of many lives with differing circumstances, individual talents and with gifts wonderfully varied. The details of each life are so numerous that we begin to see in them the great diversity among us and with it great strength and enrichment. And from varied experiences comes one great unifying truth echoing and re-echoing. I know God lives and loves me. It was only a few months earlier in February that Bell S. Spafford, Relief Society president for 29 years, passed away at the age of 86. President Spafford had always encouraged women to develop their full potential, but continually emphasized that the role of wife, mother, and homemaker must take precedence over all other interests. On April 1st, 1982, the church's membership passed the five million mark having increased approximately two million since 1971. With the expanding membership throughout the world came the need for more temples. Just prior to April conference, the church announced the construction of four new temples in Boise, Idaho, Denver, Colorado, Guayaquil, Ecuador, and Taipei, Taiwan. In September of 1982, the Tabernacle Choir would celebrate its 50th anniversary with CBS radio. It was on September 4th, 1932, that it performed its first CBS broadcast in its now traditional Sunday morning time period. A series of other international and historical events filled the summer months of 1982. The Tabernacle Choir presented 10 concerts in eight European cities. The BYU Lamanite generation was on a 19-day tour in the People's Republic of China. The 37th and 38th stakes in England were organized in Manchester, bringing all of Great Britain under stake administration for the first time. In August, 17 historical sites at Nauvoo, Illinois were dedicated by President Hinckley. Nauvoo was the crucible of Mormonism, he said, a crucible of vision, a crucible of leadership, a crucible of faith. In Utah, President Reagan toured the welfare services Ogden Cannery and acknowledged the church's great success with the welfare program. The key to making self-reliance spiritual is in using the freedom to comply with God's commandments. The scriptures are very clear in their command that it is the duty of those who have to give to those who are in need. During the 1982 October conference, it was announced that the Book of Mormon would be given a subtitle. By recent decision of the brethren, the Book of Mormon will henceforth bear the title, The Book of Mormon, Another Testament of Jesus Christ. The stick or record of Judah, the Old Testament, and the New Testament, and the stick or record of Ephraim, the Book of Mormon, 
another testament of Jesus Christ, are now woven together in such a way that as you pour over one, you are drawn to the other. As you learn from one, you are enlightened by another. They are indeed one in our hands. Ezekiel's prophecy now stands fulfilled. Later in the year, the new Latter-day Saint edition of the Bible received the Layman's National Bible Committee Bible Award. The citation is an appreciation of outstanding service to the Bible cause through the publication of its own edition of the King James Version, which features interpretive chapter headings, a simplified footnote system, and the linking of references to all other LDS scriptures thereby greatly enhancing the study of the Bible by its membership. It's a great pleasure to present this to you, President Hinckley. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. In November, the church mourned the passing away of President N. Eldon Tanner. Called into the councils of the church in 1960, he served 22 years as a counselor to four church presidents. We believe that God still speaks <coughs> to his people on the earth today, and that the church is being led by a prophet of God even Spencer W. Kimball, through whom the Lord speaks. The gospel message is sweet. It is a message of peace and goodwill. It is the only way, <clears throat> the only thing that will bring peace to the world and offer salvation and exaltation to all who will accept it. May this testimony come to everyone who is seeking the truth. Is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. He was praised for his managerial genius and his talents that were especially suited to the needs of a growing worldwide church. Honesty, integrity, and dependability are the words friends use to describe him. He earned the respect and devotion of millions without seeking such far-reaching popularity and was genuinely humbled by the honors he received. For nearly 80 years, Nathan Eldon Tanner led an exemplary life. Two days later, the church's first presidency was reorganized with President Marion G. Romney called as first counselor and President Gordon B. Hinckley as second counselor. 1982, the woman's role re-emphasized. Church membership surpasses five million members. A new Book of Mormon subtitle, Another Testament of Jesus Christ, and the passing of a great leader. On January 11, 1983, another stalwart leader, Elder LeGrand Richards, passed away after many years of church service. With it all, LeGrand Richards was a perennial optimist, and his words were a rare combination of wit and humor, comfort, encouragement, and wisdom. Can't buy that kind of feeling in the hearts of young people with money. The Lord who creates the feelings of the human breast is the only one who can put that kind of faith into the hearts of his people. Is this red now? Is my time to quit? <laughs> I think they got the red button on here, and I mustn't indulge on the other man's time. His full-time church service began when Elder Richards was called to be the presiding bishop in 1938. Fourteen years later, he was named to the Council of the Twelve Apostles. During his lifetime, he had memorized a seemingly endless reservoir of scriptures, poems, and anecdotes, which he called upon every time he spoke. As a husband, father, missionary, orator, and religious leader, LeGrand Richards earned the love and respect of millions. His life was much like the title of a popular book he once wrote, A Marvelous Work and a Wonder. Prior to the 1983 April General Conference, a special dedicatory service was held for the newly remodeled Assembly Hall. Great effort was made to retain the original builder's intent, to improve the building's overall appearance, and to enhance its technical capabilities. Due to the absence of President Kimball and President Romney because of illness, the conference sessions were conducted by President Hinckley and President Ezra Taft Benson of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles. There is a continuity and consistency in this work that is remarkable to witness and experience. 
Its strength and power lie in the availability to every member and every earnest investigator to know for himself or herself by the power of the Holy Spirit that it is true. Critics may wear out their lives in trying to deny or demean or cast doubt, but all who ask of God in faith have the assurance that by the voice of the Spirit will come the certainty that this work is divine. During the summer and fall of 1983, church leadership was busy with temple dedication ceremonies for the Atlanta, Georgia, Apia, Samoa, Nukuelo, Fatonga, and Santiago, Chile temples. President Kimball and President Romney attended the opening session of the 1983 October Conference. President Benson gave focus to the conference session. My message and testimony is this. Only Jesus Christ is uniquely qualified to provide that hope, that confidence, and that strength to overcome the world and rise above our human failings. To do that, we must place our faith in Him and live by his laws and teachings. During the Saturday morning session, Elder Franklin D. Richards was released from the first quorum of the 70 presidency and called to serve as the president of the Washington, D.C. Temple. Elder Richard G. Scott was sustained to fill the vacancy in the first quorum of the 70 presidency. On October 16, 1983, the 1147th stake of Zion was organized in Kirtland, Ohio. It had been only four years since the Nauvoo stake, number 1,000, was created in 1979. Later that month, the Papaete Tahiti Temple was dedicated, and in December, the Mexico City, Mexico Temple was dedicated. 1983, the passing of a great missionary. Temple dedications continue throughout the world, and the 1,147th stake is created in Kirtland, Ohio. Early in 1984, Elder Mark E. Peterson, another stalwart leader, passed away on January 11th. Shall we be like Mary and believe and accept him? Or shall we join the doubters and shroud ourselves in the darkness of unbelief? Jesus is a God of light and life, not a symbol of death and doubt. He lives and will save everyone who is willing to serve him. He is our divine redeemer and our eternal creator. He is the resurrection and the life. This is our testimony to the world. Elder Peterson, a prolific writer, penned the weekly church news editorial for more than 50 years and claimed authorship of more than 40 books and pamphlets. He was called to be an apostle in April of 1944. He devoted much of his time to the church's missionary program and was instrumental in the development of the church's visitor centers throughout the world. Afflicted in later years with illness, he refused to slow his pace. He was committed to a cause and was not willing to let physical difficulties stand in the way of performing his duties. Just prior to the 154th Annual General Conference in April, President Hinckley conducted the dedication of the new Museum of Church History and Art. Unnumbered multitudes of people will visit this museum in the years to come. Their appreciation for the builders of the past will be enhanced. There will be stirred within them a desire to seek for the good and the beautiful and to preserve it for the future. They will be motivated to cultivate their own talents. The culture of the entire community will be lifted by reason of this museum in our midst. On April 7, 1984, the church announced construction of five new temples in San Diego, California, Portland, Oregon, Las Vegas, Nevada, Toronto, Canada, and Bogota, Colombia. This brought the total number of temples in operation to 25, with five planned for dedication in 1984. 
During the opening session of conference, Elder Russell M. Nelson and Elder Dallin H. Oaks were called to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. This was the first time in 41 years that two new members of the Twelve were sustained in the same general session. It was in October of 1943 that Elder Spencer W. Kimball and Elder Ezra Taft Benson were sustained as apostles. Later during the session, six new members of the Quorum of the Seventy were called. John K. Carmack, Russell C. Taylor, Robert B. Harbertson, Devere Harris, Spencer H. Osborne, and Philip T. Sontag. President Hinckley announced that these calls would no longer be lifetime callings. After much prayerful consideration, we have called six men, mature and tested through long years of service, to become members of the First Quorum of the Seventy, to serve for periods of three to five years, just as a mission president or temple president would do, and then to be released with honor and appreciation. While they so serve, they will be general authorities with every right, power, and authority necessary to function. Because of the Church's phenomenal growth and the unchanging divine mandate to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world, 13 area presidencies were called under the direction of the First Presidency and the Council of the Twelve Apostles. Members of the Quorum of the Seventy would assist in guiding the Church's growth in the various world regions. In addition, Barbara W. Winder was called as General Relief Society President with the release of Barbara B. Smith, and Ardeth Cap was called as General Young Women's President with the release of Elaine A. Cannon. May 1984 brought the dedication of the Boise, Idaho Temple. During the summer of 1984, the Tabernacle Choir was invited to sing at the Olympic Gala just prior to the opening of the Summer Olympic Games in Los Angeles. During the games, many Latter-day Saint athletes participated in the events. No one will forget the performance of gymnast Peter Vidmar. We're back here at Pauley Pavilion, and the man, the only man, with a chance to tie Lee Ning for this gold medal, Peter Vidmar. He needs a 10. Let us never lose sight of the gospel in pursuing our temporal ambitions. We didn't come to this world to become Olympic champions, or great doctors, lawyers, or businessmen, or to become rich and famous. We came here to prove ourselves worthy of returning back to the presence of our Heavenly Father. We came here to set and reach the highest goal possible. Our new Miss America, Miss Utah, Charlene Wells. Later in the year, Charlene Wells, the daughter of Elder Robert E. Wells of the Quorum of Seventy, was crowned Miss America. During the priesthood session of October Conference, President Hinckley introduced these and other outstanding individuals before the priesthood body of the church. This is Peter Vidmar, who won two golds and a silver at the recent Olympic Games in Los Angeles. The best in the world in his category of sports and a faithful Latter-day Saint and an example to us. And Dale Murphy of the Atlanta Braves, the best baseball player in the world. <laughs> and we're very, very proud of him. And we're honored to have these brethren with us tonight and happy to st have them stand before you. Thank you very much, brethren. I wish that Charlene Wells were here. <laughs> 
Coach Lavelle Edwards, who led the BYU football team to a national championship and who would be voted NCAA Coach of the Year, addressed the general priesthood session. If I could draw one general conclusion, it would be that if an athlete could play well before he went on a mission, he will definitely play well when he returns. And if an athlete could not play well before his mission, he probably won't play well when he returns. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> his chances of playing well are perhaps better if he goes because he will return with a greater understanding of himself, greater leadership capabilities, better work habits, and a better knowledge of what it takes to be successful. The 154th semi-annual General Conference convened on October 6, 1984. Elder Royden G. Derrick was released from the first quorum of the 70 presidency to serve as president of the Seattle Temple. Elder Marion D. Hanks was sustained to fill the vacancy in the first quorum of the 70 presidency. John Sonnenberg, F. Arthur K., and Keith W. Wilcox were sustained into the quorum of the 70. During the summer and fall of 1984, five additional temples were dedicated in Sydney, Australia, Manila, the Philippines, Dallas, Texas, Taipei, Taiwan, and Guatemala City, Guatemala. 1984, new priesthood and auxiliary leadership, the calling of area presidencies, and international recognition for many faithful church members. On January 27, 1985, members of the church were asked to participate in a fast for the African famine victims. The offering brought forth more than $6 million. I, for one, am deeply grateful for the opportunity to assist in blessing those of our Father's children in that part of the earth who are in such desperate need. I am confident that there springs up in the heart of each of you a feeling of appreciation for what has come to pass and will yet further come to pass as the result of many of our people with one heart doing so small a thing as refraining from two meals and contributing the value thereof to a common effort. Just prior to the April conference, the 182 mission presidents from all over the world were called to a special missionary conference in Salt Lake City. Along with the reintroduction of the hymn, Called to Serve, a new missionary lesson plan was presented. The plan was designed to allow missionaries more flexibility and placed special emphasis on a reliance on the Spirit and the Book of Mormon. During the 1985 April Conference, William Grant Bangeter was sustained as a member of the first quorum of the 70 presidency to fill the vacancy created by the death of G. Homer Durham. Presiding Bishop Victor L. Brown with his counselors H. Burke Peterson and J. Richard Clark were released and sustained to the quorum of the 70, and Elder Robert D. Hales was sustained as presiding bishop with Henry B. Eyring as first counselor and Glenn L. Pace as second counselor. Three additional brethren were called to the quorum of the 70, Hans Benjamin Ringer, Waldo Pratt Call Sr., and Helio de Roca Camargo. In April, Elder Bruce R. McConkie passed away. After 39 years of service, the last 13 as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, Elder McConkie emerged as one of the church's foremost theologians. He once said there was nothing he would rather do than preach the gospel. It was at April conference that Elder McConkie gave his final testimony. 13 days before his death on April 19, 1985. And as pertaining to Jesus Christ, I testify that he is the Son of the living God, who was crucified for the sins of the world. He is our Lord, our God, and our King. This I know of myself, independent of any other person. I am one of his witnesses. And in the coming day, I shall feel the nail marks in his hands and in his feet, and shall wet his feet with my tears. But I shall not know any better then than I know now that he is God's almighty Son, that he is our Savior and Redeemer, and that salvation comes in and through his atoning blood 
and in no other way. God grant that all of us may walk in the light as God our Father is in the light, so that according to the promises, <laughs> the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, will cleanse us from all sin. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Airborne and has cleared the tower. In the spring, Utah Senator Jake Garn and astronaut Don Lind were the first church members to circle the Earth in the space shuttle. Later in the summer, the historic 97-year-old Manti Temple was rededicated after extensive remodeling. Other temples were dedicated in Stockholm, Sweden, Chicago, Illinois, and Freiburg, Germany, the first temple to be built in eastern Germany. At the other end of the world, the Johannesburg, South Africa temple also was dedicated. And later in December, the temple in Seoul, South Korea. In September, at a special gathering in the assembly hall, President Hinckley quoted the Lord's promise that a song of righteousness is a prayer unto him. It was a celebration commemorating the printing of the new church hymn book, the first since 1948. During October conference, Elder M. Russell Ballard was called from the first quorum of the 70 presidency to the Council of the Twelve Apostles, and Elder J. Thomas Fiennes was released from the first quorum of the 70 presidency to fill an assignment in the South America South Area presidency. Elders Jack H. Goslin Jr. and Robert L. Backman were called to replace Elders Ballard and Fiennes as new members of the first quorum of the 70 presidency. Later in October, the new genealogical library was dedicated. With the call of Elder Backman to the first quorum of the 70 presidency, Elder Von J. Featherstone and Elder Rex D. Pinnegar remained in the new young men presidency with Elder Featherstone as president, Elder Pinnegar as first counselor, and Robert L. Simpson as the new second counselor. Later that month, the 10,000th ward was organized, 36 being created every month throughout the world. It was on November 5th, 1985, at the age of 90, Prophet Spencer W. Kimball passed away. be known as the one who loves my brothers and sisters. I would like that love to be extended far, far and near. And my feeling is whenever I think of any of the countries of the world which I have visited in my lifetime, that I have a very great love for them, for them as individuals. President Kimball not only sought the will of the Lord on all matters that affected the church, but he was totally amenable to the will of the Lord after receiving the answer. On one occasion, I tried to slow him down a little, and he said, Gordon, my life is like my shoes, to be worn out in service. Spencer Woolley Kimball was 78 years old when he became president of the church in December of 1973. He will long be remembered as a temple builder and great missionary advocate. During his administration, the revelation on the priesthood was received, allowing all male members to receive its blessings. During his administration, the missionary force nearly doubled to more than 30,000 full-time missionaries around the globe. Proselyting spread to black Africa, the Caribbean, and Southeast Asia for the first time. He undertook the building of more than two dozen temples dotting every continent. The previous 140 years of church history saw the building of only 19 temples. He was also one of the most widely traveled leaders of the church, ever exhorting the saints to improve their lives through service to others. Now let us go forth having been edified to bless and edify our families, our neighbors and our friends. And we are bound together by the fact that we are all literal children of our Heavenly Father, and that He loves us.
On November 11, 1985, President Ezra Taft Benson was ordained and set apart as President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My heart has been filled with an overwhelming love and compassion for all members of the Church and our Heavenly Father's children everywhere. I love all our Father's children of every color, creed, and political persuasion. My only desire is to serve as the Lord would have me do. Elder Gordon B. Hinckley was called as first counselor and Elder Thomas S. Monson as second counselor. President Marion G. Romney now became president of the Council of the Twelve Apostles. Due to President Romney's health, Elder Howard W. Hunter was called as acting president. So came to an end 1985, and with it, the closing of an exciting era. New organization changes and the transition of leadership to a new prophet. During the five-year period, church membership increased by 1,282,000. The missionary effort recorded a total of 1,011,042 convert baptisms, and the number of temples in operation nearly doubled from 19 to 37, with 10 new temples under construction. But beyond this, it was the quiet yet dedicated work of saints throughout the world, who working together as families serving friends and neighbors we're building the kingdom of God. A five-year period wherein the threefold mission of the church, proclaiming the gospel, perfecting the saints, and redeeming the dead, became the focus of worldwide proportion. In no other five-year period has the church taken such tremendous strides forward, and with a transition of leadership, it will continue its worldwide growth and influence. This is The Church in Action, 1981 through 1985.